You're listening to The Career Bootcamp, your supply chain career accelerated, a five podcast series sponsored by IBM and powered by Procurious. Hello, I'm Helen McKenzie, Principal Advisor at Procurious, and I'm your host for this series that's designed to get your wheels moving forward towards the supply chain role of your dreams. Our podcast features coaches from supply chain, academia, and the world of cycling. They'll be sharing their top career tips and how you can learn from their experience to get ahead. Today's podcast was recorded on location at the Big Ideas Summit in Chicago. Your host today is Procurious founder, Tanya Seary. Hello, my name is Tanya Seary and I'm the founder of Procurious. I'm joined today by Professor Moran Cerf, who's a neuroscientist at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University in the USA. As you know, this week we're talking about maximising your career performance with the Career Boot Camp, which is proudly being sponsored by IBM Watson Supply Chain. I'm really delighted to have Professor Surf with us, such an interesting man. And of course, you know me, I'm going to ask the tricky question first. Professor Surf, you were actually originally a hacker. Yeah, I have a 15 year career, if you can call it career, before I became a neuroscientist of trying to break into banks and government institutes to try to find flaws in security. And then what inspired you then to become a neuroscientist? I imagine that being a hacker is a little bit more financially lucrative. <laughs> it is. It's more lucrative. And I think at the time it was even seen like magic. No one knew hackers. They were kind of just glorious characters. Now I think it's a little bit more down to earth. You know about them. They have mm-hmm. kind of mixed feelings about them and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think for me it was a, a combination of luck and many you know, day-to-day circumstances. Uh, but primarily, I think it was like most things, one meeting, and for me it was a meeting with the late Francis Crick, who was a remarkable scientist, the discoverer of the DNA, who himself was a hacker during World War II, and when he met me years after as a kid, basically, and learned about my profession, he said, what are you doing time giving the secrets to banks? You should go and do science with it because the ultimate vault the ultimate black box, the ultimate secret of the world lies in our brain. And if you know how to break into complex systems, you should apply it to the most interesting and complex one, the brain. Do it. I did. Amazing. And now you're a world-leading neuroscientist. I guess that shows the power of a mentor and someone pointing out a direction. Yeah. You need someone to tell you that there's kind of a chance and then you do it. Mm, amazing. Now, what about neuroscience? I mean, in our profession, procurement and supply chain, everyone's talking about AI, machine learning. Can you just share one snippet of information that may be of interest to our audience? Because we really are here today to talk about peak performance. But of course, having an expert here, we need to know the latest. So here's kind of the, the key insight, I think, that I give my students when they ask about that, which is that The hallmark of smartness is our brain. We have evolved over many, many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years to become what we are right now. And we have this remarkable thing in our head that solves complex problems, creates new ideas, uh, imagines the future, composes music, does everything that we see right now. Mm. And it does that in a remarkable way we don't understand, but we can replicate. And what AI, machine learning, and deep learning, and all of those tools do is trying to learn how the brain does things and mimic that using computers Mm -hmm. in ways that scale. So Mm. the big advantage of computers is that it can do it all the time. It can be on when Mm. we're sleeping. It can do it across many, many systems at the same time in parallel. It can do things in a more more efficient way. Mm. But still, our brain is better on most processing. We generate less heat, and we do it in a much cleverer and more efficient way. This isn't to say that AI isn't beating us in many things because AI is doing it at scale. Mm. But the brain is still better. And I think that right now where neuroscientists are spending all of their time is saying, okay, the brain is still better, but machines are getting closer and closer. Yes. So what we should do is improve the brain. And the kind of world I'm playing in right now is a world where we have this idea, experimental idea that we call human version 2.0, where we try to improve the brain and actually have a new version that's better. Well, you know I love this idea. I'd love to augment my brain.
excellent and how to reach peak performance. And the theme for this week is cycling. Now, do you cycle at all? I or? do. I oh. go every year with a few friends on a long cycle journey. Uh, last year was Sardinia. We crossed the country from north to south. Oh, Before that, it was in Europe, in the, uh, the north of Europe, in yeah. the, uh, basically England where we cross the country west to east. Wow, uh, so we road did. bikes, yeah. obviously, yeah. I thought you were going to say every year in the Tour de France and you get to wear the yellow jersey. I was getting all excited. So you've actually done some research on, you know, obviously neuroscience and how we maintain peak performance. Do you mind sharing what you've learned with our listeners today? So the point of the study is to answer the question, how come some people perform better in some conditions using the same brain and the same body. So think about uh, basketball players. Some of them play better games when they play home game versus outside game. Now, the reality is that it's the same player, same training, same muscles, same arms, same rules, same team. Everything is the same, but somehow they perform better in inside games than outside games. Somehow, the fact that your mom is in the audience and cheering you up is actually helpful. This means that there's a difference in how you perform based on what your brain experiences, how you think about the game. So we took this one step further and we said, let's look at the brain and try to understand what is it in the brain that changes, and if so, can we harness that to help you do better? So we worked with uh, Red Bull, who sponsors a number of athletes, we brought them to Los Angeles to try to see if we can actually tap into this part of the brain that uh, regulates your performance, <clears throat> and we did it uh, in the following way. We flew to Los Angeles and we took all the athletes that are uh, sponsored by Red Bull who came to Los Angeles and we had them to do a simple thing in a task where we told them, we're gonna have you do something uh, athletic and play with your brain in the following way. We put the athletes on a stationary bike and we told them, we want you to cycle on the bike for a few minutes right now. We're gonna increase the power and make it a little bit hard on you. And we get to a point where it's about 80% of the performance. So it's pretty, pretty hard. Uh, power that they have to uh, cycle through. And we're going to ask you to cycle for a while. And the only requirement is for you to not stop until we tell you to. So you continue as long as I tell you to not stop. Cyclists come, sit on the bike, start cycling. We increase the power, get them to a point that it's pretty hard, and then uh, they cycle. And then after a few minutes, it starts being painful. And they say, hey, uh, when am I going to stop? It's pretty hard. So I just continue. I'll tell you to stop in a few minutes. Continue. And the guy does a few more minutes, let's say, and says, hey, I'm really, really tired. When do I get stopped? Say, so just go on a little bit longer. And the reality is that we intend uh, to never ask them to stop until they break. So we want them to break. And at some point, they all break. At some point, they all stop and say, I can't do it anymore. This is a moment where your brain resolves this conflict between the muscles saying, we don't want to do it. And the part of the brain that says, you got to do it in a breakage of the uh, system and just giving in. So what we do is we look at the brain in the seconds before you gave in and try to understand were there some precursors? Were there ways for us to know that you're about to break by looking at the brain, by looking at the system in your brain that self-regulates, that controls the other systems? And because we did find those systems, we can actually bring the athletes the day after and say, hey, we're doing something else today. We're asking you to cycle like we did before. We won't tell you when to stop until you can't do it anymore, only that when we see that the part of the brain that is controlling your ability to perform is active, as in we know that you're about to break in a few seconds, we're gonna play a sound to you. And this sound indicates to you that we know that in your brain you're about to collapse. And we ask you to just stay 10 seconds longer after you hear the sound, so a little bit more. Kind of play with pain a little longer and give yourself a little bit more push, a little more power afterwards. And the reality is that for most of us, when we think we can't do it anymore, we still have a lot more room in the bottom. So just giving the brain a signal that there is such room kind of gives you a little bit more power. It's kind of like your mom cheering you up at the last mile of the marathon and suddenly you have more power for one more 10 minute mile. In that sense, this little boost from the brain is helpful in athletes getting boost in their performance. And this means we can now train athletes to do better by giving them some readout of their brain. And I'm saying athletes because these are the ones we tested, but you can think about any condition where self-control is important. When there's a, a sugary cake in front of you and you're battling in your mind whether to eat it or not, the same system is the one that says, I shouldn't do that, and fighting with another system says, but it's sugar and it's great for us. And this battle is what's trying to resolve in those situations, and now we can actually train this part of the brain to do better.
to improve your self-control. This is a skill that is helpful to many people outside of the world of athletes or the world of dieters. It's important for managers, it's important for uh, writers who have this desire to stop writing because they don't have a good idea and they need to continue digging in their brain. It's true for a lot of people in a lot of domains. And what we're showing right now is that we can actually understand how the system in the brain works. It controls that and improves it. So it's like training another new muscle in your head, which is the self-control, which is not the muscles that you can train in the gym, but it's a muscle that neuroscience can help you get better at. Wow, and so there are some senior leaders, corporate leaders who are studying this and really uh, training themselves for peak for performance. We get all kinds of, I bet after this uh, <laughs> kind of podcast is going to come out, I'm going to get calls from a lot of CEOs of company, a lot of like managers, particularly in fields where they make decisions all the time. Yes. And they know that they can do better, are calling us and basically say, just run my brain through this relatively simple uh, analysis mm. that gives me a feedback. It says, here is your brain's profile. And it's mm. not that there's right and wrong here. It's not that like, it's better to make decisions in the morning. You want to know what your brain is so you can align the reality with it. If your brain performs best between the hours of 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. on this particular task, yes. like you make decisions better on this particular thing at 9 a.m., you want to align your schedule mm. such that those decisions will happen in those hours. Mm. You just want to make the world work with you because you want to maximize your performance. It's not that there's always 9 a.m. is the best time for everyone. Some people are better at midnight. Yes. And they should somehow find a way to make it such that mm. the world exists on midnight for them. Wow, that's just such great advice. And if you can't come to Chicago and consult with Professor Surf and the team at uh, you know Kellogg, I think the key things I took out there was that we can always do more. You know, our brain tells us to give up, but there is more in the tank, as we say. And the second thing is just becoming more conscious of what your brain is telling you or, or how it's performing at different stages. And if you can just maybe build that level of consciousness, you can improve your performance. I would say the following way, in an easy way. So if you can't afford or time-wise or financially or location-wise or in many ways, the ability to actually have a neuroscientist look at your brain <laughs> and give you a reading of who you are internally, there are secondary things you can do that are actually not bad, which is keep a diary. So what we advise a lot of people who ask us and can't do the entire process is take a week of your life, any week, it doesn't matter, and for that week, pick a diary with you and write down relatively as many uh, choices as you can, what were the options, what did you choose in the end? And what were the conditions that led you to this choice? So example would be you go to the restaurant, someone offers you a steak, a salmon, and a salad, and you choose the salmon. Uh, write down, these were the options. I chose the salmon. Uh, I was with friends. I was under pressure. Uh, it was a little bit cold. Uh, I didn't have food for the five hours prior. Whatever you can make that you mm. think is relevant to the choice. And then one more thing, right afterwards, was it a good choice? As in, I'm happy with my choice, or I'm unhappy, this was a mistake. If you have a list of those, just a list that you made with all the biases that you have yourself, you will still see that you can find meaning. So you can look back after the week is over at all the choices and you'll see that you typically make cho choices better when you're uh, with this particular person. Mm -hmm. You make decisions better when you're uh, not, not tired. tired. <laughs> yeah. so you, you will see something, some of them will be obvious, but I bet some things that will come up are not trivial and not known to you. And this will be the, the light version of neuroscience, which just gives you some reading of how you are under various conditions. And any week will be good for that because it's you who is there all the time. Professor Seth, that's fantastic advice. And thank you so much for joining us today. It was More absolutely fantastic. Thank you, guys. Thank you. You've been listening to the Career Bootcamp podcast series, Your Supply Chain Career Accelerated, sponsored by IBM and powered by Procurious. Why not head on over to the Supply Chain Pros group on Procurious, where you'll find lots more related content. If you have a question about the series or for our guests, please use the discussion board on Procurious or the hashtag Career Bootcamp on Twitter. Thank you for listening.